The reason I think this conversation is important right now is far greater than personal interest. Uh, I'm very much interested in this, and this is just the life story that I've lived to date. But it's interesting because we live in a time where, by and large, the Christian understanding of the cosmos is, is not universally accepted in America. Let's just stay here in our home. Uh, but beyond that, it's like we've, we've gone beyond secularism. We've kind of left secularism behind. And now it's like this whole Wild West in our culture. And what's post secular. Right. And so what's really interesting is, you know, take away the Christian narrative in that in that understanding. And at the same time, you see a rise in psychedelics. And you see a rise um, in tarot cards. You see a rise in different forms of occultism because Even like explicit pagan worship right i mean there are actually um there are actually temples right. being built in iceland to thor yeah. and, right. and odin again it's and, wild and and exactly you know my, my point is that i i don't know if it was c.s lewis that said this but it's the the phrase that says if you deny men food they'll gobble poison and it, you, you can't take away the human yearning for transcendence. You can't take away the human yearning to respond to something greater than ourselves, right? I was thinking, I was trying to think back to when I first actually like became aware of your existence. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, um, my earliest recollections were probably your associations with uh, what you were doing with Morningstar oh, quite wow. some time ago. That and is probably, some time ago. yeah, probably I have a I have a recollection of a you know hammer dulcimer playing, but also like a scene in my mind, and maybe if this is actually a real scene, you could like you know <laughs> kind of. Uh, confirm it or, or not uh confirm it but um anyways uh the the scene that i have in my mind is a picture of morning star leonard jones is probably up there too and some like incredible drum circle thing is oh, happening yeah. like a like a 20 minute percussion oh, yeah. vamp Totally. Is that ringing a bell? I mean, that was probably like every Friday night there, but yeah, I mean, that was life in those days for sure. Yeah, so, <laughs> yeah, I was always leading the charge to get something with goat skin pounded on, you know, and yeah. Uh, so yeah, that that sounds about right for that time period. That was probably two thousand seven. That's it. Okay, that's, that's a few minutes ago. <laughs> yeah, yeah, um, and then sounds of water, songs of water, yeah, songs of water, yeah. yeah. Yep. So I think one of the things that always struck me was um, you you seem to be going after something like I was really really intrigued in at the time too, mm -hmm. and I I think I'm I think maybe we're both working through like language still for that yeah those experiences right for sure um, and maybe not to discount the language we used in the past but maybe to have like multiple heuristic lenses to try to interpret it through, yes. maybe to bring it into like a more holistic frame of understanding what's going on in our bodies and our minds and those experiences. But I was so interested in the spontaneous, the mm -hmm. like getting off the page in music and the thing that happened in that, which I now would like describe as the flow state. Totally. You know? And still, I don't disassociate that with the language I'd also used at the time, like the anointing, right. the presence of God, encountering the Spirit. You know, I, I don't, I'm not divorced from that language mm -hmm. either, but I'm also really fascinated as I look back and I'm, uh, 
I'm trying to work through what's going on there. Mm -hmm. How did some of it lead to incredible good things, fruitfulness in my life and life of other people? But how did I also see um, those states of maybe self-transcendence not get steered in a like a teleological direction that I saw lead to good in people's lives, but also maybe lead, led to foolishness. So yes. those are some things I'm working through, yeah. and I'm sure you probably have been too. <laughs> well, it's really interesting for me because, you know, I didn't grow up in church at all, and I certainly didn't grow up in the charismatic streams of the church. Okay. However, uh, music and art, have always been tied to spirituality for me from the very beginnings. And I always knew that there was there was something inherently spiritual that music offered, particularly with percussion and rhythm and some of these, uh, you know, m more trance-like states yes. that, that could be yes. associated with music and rhythm. I studied indigenous music for a number of years. I'm a bit of a layman's ethnomusicologist of sorts, and so I, I studied West African drumming. I studied classical Indian percussion as well as Egyptian and Arabic percussion. I played uh, semi-professionally with, uh, within Middle Eastern circles, going from Sufi tea houses to uh, I played at an Arabic wedding reception, a Greek wedding reception. That was fun, you know. So I was, I found myself in all of these environments where music was being used as a catalyst to really draw you into a deeper spiritual experience, right? And so during those years, I didn't, I didn't know what to call it. I, I there was a different language, you know, and. And to be fair, I think that there are some similarities, but some very stark differences as well from what we would have experienced in charismatic circles like the ones that you mentioned at Morningstar. But I did come with a bit of an inheritance that I don't think was all bad or something that had to be thrown out. I think there was a bit of reframing and recontextualizing and re-understanding music and spiritual experience and the flow state in through a Christian lens, as opposed to some of the context that I was in prior to that, but it's fascinated me. And now I've been, um, you know, stumbling through grace for the past twenty six years of my life, and that that pursuit has only grown in scope over these years. And uh, you mentioned songs of water; that was very much based in. A lot of instrumental music, um, a, a lot of improvisation, a lot of spontaneity, and and really reaching for something larger than ourselves uh, through the music, you know. So that was we one can, of we my take go to. This, yeah, we can take this conversation in many directions from there. <laughs> so there was that, you know. I remember, um, so like when Carrie and I first got married in our apartment, you know, we had a two bedroom apartment even though it was just the two of us, we didn't have any kids at the time. And I, we kind of like dedicated one of the rooms in the apartment to kind of be like recording space for me, a prayer room. And I, I have these memories of, I, you know, would go into the prayer room, this little prayer room, put my headphones on and I have, a, I, you know, I'd have a playlist of your stuff mm -hmm. with, with song, songs of water Seeger Rose. Oh, yeah. You know, <laughs> like, uh, there was also like, you know, to, to be a proper Christian, I had like Matt Redman's Face Down. Mm -hmm. that, that record is in there, of course, some Upton and Morning oh, yeah. Star. But, uh, you know, what was interesting was like the instrumental music. And I still honestly, like, I, I, I consider like Seeger Rose instrumental music for all mm -hmm. intents and purposes. You know, I mean, there's there's For there's sure. lyric there's there's vocal but to me that it's just another instrument in the composition at least the, the you know especially because i can't understand what he's saying <laughs> um, yeah but I, I was you know i think the first I, I found it interesting how the instrumental music could create in me an openness to god without lyrical accompaniment which was really interesting given like i grew up in a very evangelical 
charismatic Pentecostal context, but still like some of that core Christ against culture evangelicalism. And so, um, you know, the lyrics, you know, what, what really distinguished between a song being sacred or secular were the lyrics <laughs> on top of it, you know? So when I remember, uh, you know, when I was first starting to get into like, like rock music and stuff in middle school and, you know, um, I, my friends and I, we would trade mixtapes you know, mm -hmm. in youth group. And somebody gave me a, a CD, an actual CD, it wasn't a mixtape, and it was Plank Eye, you know, one of those tooth and nail bands. <laughs> yeah. And I was listening to it in my room, and my parents were like, what are you listening to? And I was like, mom and dad, it's Christian music, it's from a Christian <laughs> record label. And what did we do? We opened up the linear notes, and they wanted to go through the lyrics, right? you know, together. <laughs> and so... um so, but anyways, to think about the music, like you were creating with Songs of Water or something like a C. Rose, and to think about in hindsight, like how that, even instrumental music was mm -hmm. doing something in me. That was, I, at the time, again, I didn't have language for mm -hmm. it, but it, it, I became aware of it one time, I think, when I was praying. And I was like, well, there's no, there's no lyrics here. There's no like doxological uh, inclination yeah. in these lyrics. It's instruments. What's like these instruments are saying something. They're totally. communicating something. What is happening here? Yeah. You know? Well, you know, to bring it back to a scriptural reference for what you're talking about, Second Kings chapter three fifteen is one of my favorite examples of this. And you know, yes. I can tell by your face you you know the story well. It's but, wild. You yeah. know, it's like all of the nations are about to destroy Israel, and the solution is the the prophet, you know, the king goes to get the prophet, and the prophet says, well, bring me a musician, you know. And it says that as the musician played, the prophet goes into this trance experience. He goes into this encounter with the, with the divine. He goes into an encounter with God, and he sees a vision of this water coming and this this whole thing. And then he speaks it out and it changes the destiny of the entire nation based off of an experience that he had through an instrumentalist. Uh, there, there was, there was, this wasn't one of King David's worship songs in the temple. This was a musician playing while he sought the face of God. And, uh, and so that to me has always been a beautiful example of what you're talking about. Um, but there's so many other scriptures. And even when you look through the book of Psalms, David prescribes, well, this song is meant to be played on this instrument for this purpose. Well, this song is meant to be played on this instrument. This one's for the flute section. This, this song is going to best be described by the percussion section, you know? And so there's, there's all of this, um, you know, Music does have a language. It is a language. And we could argue whether it's universal or not, and there's truths on both sides of that. Yes, there is something universal about music, and then there's something very not universal about music as a language. Mm -hmm. um, I always tell a funny story, though, because for me, spirit speaks to spirit, heart speaks to heart, mind speaks to mind, intention will come uh, regardless. And years ago, I was working a job, and there was a, my coworker was a Montagnard from Vietnam, and he didn't speak any English hardly at all. He, he maybe knew 10 English words, and we're riding around in the truck together. And he starts singing a song in his native tongue. And as soon as he's singing this song that I don't understand lyrically, I don't, I don't understand his language, the hair stands up on the back of my neck, and I'm suddenly recognizing the presence of God in the truck with us. And I didn't know anything about this guy's background, his spirituality, or anything. So I'm like, I motion to him. I was like, what are you, what are you singing? He laughs. He says, song, sing, church. <laughs> <laughs> it's all he knew to say was song, yeah. sing, church. And it just mm. spoke to me because the intention of his heart and, and what was happening bypassed my mind, but it still reached my heart. And I found that to be true in instrumental music. When Songs of Water was a touring band, 
We would go out and and ninety percent of the places that that we would play were non Christian venues. Um, and uh, and man, I could tell you we could riff all day on some of the stories of things we experienced uh, performing at New Age festivals and performing. Uh, we were even invited to 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 play at a spiritual retreat that I mistakenly thought was a youth group. And uh, until they they let me know that there was a psychic and a shaman that was going to be present there with us. And so I'm like, <laughs> here we go. Let's go. And we had incredible encounters, um, you know, but all, all that's to say instrumental music is powerful to to really awaken some of the deeper mm-hmm. stirrings of the human heart, I think. Yeah, it is. You know, I, so I think one of the puzzles I'm working through, Stephen, and I think you're working through it too, based on some of the text exchange and stuff that we've had over the last maybe a couple of years that we've known each other more than just internet acquaintances, is, you know, I I realized part of, and this isn't universally the case in all charismatic contexts, so I don't want to make paint with a broad brush stroke. The context I was inhabiting, or at least the framework I had in in much of those early years of my ministry, and and it was was very um was very gnostic you know um i didn't have a celebration of the goodness of god's created order in our in the physical world in mm. our bodies right i didn't have a framework for understanding you know so if i were to talk about you know you just mentioned a, a word several times like trance that wouldn't have been something that we would have we would have associated any sort of thing like a trance with instantly being demonic or negative, right? right. Um, or if you started breaking down, for example, like, well, um, you know, we're getting like a dopamine hit mm-hmm. in worship when we sing together. Someone might have been concerned that you're reducing what was happening there to being merely that. And so, over the last, really, the last decade, as I look back on it, Stephen, I've been working through uh, as my theology, I think, has become more holistic, realizing like. The value of the incarnation, re- realizing God's goodness built in to the created order, that none of these experiences are mediated to us in ways that don't involve our minds and our bodies, mm-hmm. right? Like we're not spirits. Like I would actually, I would actually hear this stuff talk to us. Like you are a soul that lives in a body, <laughs> and I was like <laughs> fundamentally gnostic. Right? You know, I'm not a soul that lives in a body, like. Mm-hmm these things that's very uh, against the the biblical picture. So I think one of the things I've been working through, and this is where I really wanted to workshop together because our text exchange last week, you know, we were talking about um, some of the stuff that came out in my conversation with Ashley Landy on psychedelics. And, you know, so here's kind of like what the thing I've been working through, Stephen, is like what actually happened in those moments, not to demystify them, Mm -hmm. But to help me um, maybe have a more healthy appreciation of them, but also in some sense to have like um, maybe an ability to like shepherd people mm-hmm. in a particular way to help them realize that um, the flow state isn't automatically like the presence of God. Right. You know, we, so, anyways. I want to float this out here to you, and I know you've done, you were saying that you've done quite a bit of digging on like altered states of consciousness in the scriptures. Mm -hmm. So I want to throw out like kind of like the framework I work from when I'm thinking about this stuff, and you can tell me, give me your feedback on it and and where you might be situated at. So I found this in the work of David Bentley Hart, and to me, I think it's so far been the best, for me, the best description of what I think is happening. Um on an ontological level, all right? Mm -hmm. So Hart describes our our conscious, our finite participation in consciousness as a finite participation in the infinite act of divine consciousness. So if we think of um, God, and again, this is only by analogy, you know, this Mm -hmm. stuff all breaks down, but when we think about um, God's knowledge of himself and all things, right? That's the bedrock for all conscious experience. So we participate in a finite way in that infinite act of divine consciousness. So it's finite. And then as Christians, we'd also say, not only is it finite because we are finite creatures, but I'd say like historic Christian theology is it's also 
at times are is broken because of the presence of the fall. So we're not always perceiving things. One, we don't perceive the whole because we're not infinite. And we also perceive sometimes in distorted ways, like our conscious experience of reality is distorted by the presence of sin. So we don't always see things for the way they are or experience reality the way it should be experienced. But while that's a diminished experience of God's knowledge of himself, it is a real experience of God's knowledge of himself. I think part of the the fall in a cosmic sense was, and we see this actually like in evolutionary biology and evolutionary science, like our normative frame, conscious frame throughout the day is primarily preoccupied with survival, self-preservation. It's also preoccupied with how do we procreate and how do we maintain or grow our position in social groups and status ladders? Like our, um, our serotonergic system is finely tuned to, in subtle ways, pick up if we have maybe even perceived that we have been slightly demoted in our social group in ways that, like, it's, we'd almost say is like, hits us at a subconscious level. So most of our normative frame is preoccupied in ourself. That gives us a very narrow picture of the whole. So here's my working theory, Stephen. I think God has given us these tools, like music. I'd also say oftentimes dreaming is one. I want to talk about dreaming a little bit because I know that's a big part of, of these sorts of altered states of consciousness in the scriptures. And personally, I have been one that has had incredible, strange, profound, prophetic dreams So in this normative frame, our consciousness is very, very limited, and it's often distorted, our field of perception. There are tools that I think God has baked into the fabric of creation that give us an ability to have that framework altered Mm -hmm. so that we could see, instead of just this, my selfish concerns, self-preservation, survival, I can start to see more of the whole. which includes like an awareness of what we might say like principalities and powers mm-hmm. that are beyond us, um, an awareness of God that transcends like our normal maybe baseline awareness. Mm-hmm. As I look back, I think God has given us specific spiritual disciplines that the church has historically celebrated, like prayer. Mm-hmm. to alter that state of consciousness to make us more aware of that infinite well Mm -hmm. of uh truth goodness and beauty yes but then there's also like the way dreams can do that disrupt our frame music does that as well of course you know one of the things i was wrestling with with ashley last week is trying to figure out well what happens if we put certain things into our bodies Mm -hmm. which changes the chemistry and now we're not in our normative frame and now we're opened up to this so that's um that's kind of like the baseline of where I'm starting from and processing this sort of stuff and what I hope is a more holistic way. How does that jive with you and the way you've been kind of working through maybe a similar problem? Yeah. Man, there's so much there. Uh, there's so much there. But I, I think going back to what you were saying about this, this Gnostic approach that's in so much of uh, the Christian narrative that's, you know, the Christian community, not the gospel. Um, You know, we can't forget that the word became flesh and dwelled among us. That's it. That's it, yeah. You know, and um, so there's something inherently holy about the body, about the five senses. And when we think about the, the many metaphors that are used... I am the bread of life. You know, there's taste. I am the light of the world. There's sight. Hear, O Israel. There's the ear. You know, Thomas has invited to to touch, to put his finger inside the wounds of Christ. You know, the senses are are everywhere. You know, um, my visual art friends love to remind me that visual art was in the temple before music ever showed up. Um, Mm. You know, there's, there's... there's a sensory experience that is inherently tied to the spirit. Uh, 
into the spiritual experience. And I think as, as human beings, we are created to respond. You know, God would be the great initiator. God would be the great artist. Uh, and by nature, we are reflective beings, right? Uh, it's in our nature to to reflect and to respond. This might be a rabbit trail for another podcast, another day. But I think uh, if you want to talk about an original sin of Adam, I think the original sin of Adam involves passivity. I don't think the opposite of creativity is destruction. Destruction can actually be a helpful part of the creative process. But what is the opposite of the creative process is passivity. And in Genesis 3, you see that passivity. It was a lack of responding, right? Mm, that's and a good so, point, yeah. You know, and so when we, whether we're talking about music, whether we're talking about art, whether we're talking about a chemical that was put in someone's body, all of these things are triggers that elicit a response from us. If you hear a song or if you taste a food or if you encounter this thing, it's calling for a response, right? And so I think that when, you know, I love what William Blake said. You know, he said, if the doors of perception were cleansed, everything would appear to man as it is, infinite. You know, and, and so... There is this understanding that, yes, whether it's through Genesis 3 and, and everything that happened on the other side of that, that, that we do see in part, we don't see the whole picture. The doors of our perception are not cleansed. We, we are geared towards survival. We are geared towards selfishness and how to survive and, and keep our status and all the things you mentioned. But what's interesting to me is that the way I understand the Christian invitation is that we're invited to have the mind of Christ. We're invited, you know, Paul talked about being seated in the heavenly places. So there's this exalted perspective that paradoxically enough, humility is the way you get there. Yeah. Um, you know, there, but, but there's this understanding, there's this invitation into the mind of God, into the mind of Christ that we are invited to share in. And in my work with creativity and art, which if you cut me, that's what I'm going to bleed. You know, all roads lead back to the sanctification of the arts with me. The first thing that we see happening between the divine and the human is that God invites us into the creative process to finish the creative work he, he initiated when he, when he invited Adam to name the animals, right? So God didn't need the little dirtling to name these creatures that he had just brought forth, but there was something in the heart of God that desired Adam's response. There's that response again, that desired Adam's participation, right? Mm. And I don't think you can escape that in your humanity, regardless of whether you're ready to put the Jesus language on that or not, we are all, it's baked into our humanity that we, we need to respond. And so we're looking for that, that thing that's calling out to us for the response. And, um, you know, when we talk about whether it's psychedelic experiences or whether we're talking about the flow states or whether, you know, we're talking about altered states of consciousness, whatever it might be, I know in my own life, I was trying to, to respond to something that I knew was a calling on my life. You know, for me, drugs and the psychedelic experiences of my younger years were never just about partying. Maybe sometimes they were, but, but for the most part, I was trying to get in touch with ultimate meaning. I wanted to get in yes. touch with something larger than myself. I grew up in a little podunk town in the South where nothing happened. And so I was reaching out for purpose and significance in my life. I wanted, I wanted to hear the call. I wanted to know something was calling to me. You know what I mean? Yeah. And so how this all ties in with music and art and um you know, these, these otherworldly experiences, if you want to call them that, is that there's something, 
at the core of who we are that's meant to encounter ultimate reality. Now, I, I don't think that all of the ways that we go about trying to have that encounter are legitimate, and I don't think that they all lead to the places that we really want them to go. Um, yes. And, you know, that could quickly lead into some discussions about what the heck is the spirit world then and what the heck is this, mm. this mm. Uh, you know, beyond the five senses and all that. But, but I think something that we've missed in our Christian tradition is that there is a beautiful tradition within, um, within Christianity of encountering God through intimate experiences um, that involve the five senses, that involve the arts, that involve music, that that go beyond just a rationalistic understanding, and and that freaks some people yes. out. You know? It does. It's it's not. It doesn't freak us out. It doesn't freak people out necessarily that have spent maybe formative years in charismatic Pentecostal context, mm-hmm. uh, or even you know maybe more contemplative strains of Catholicism, for example, Eastern Orthodoxy, where the contemplative plays a vital role. But there are, especially in America and in the West, there are plenty of people that grew up in Christian traditions that were completely shut off to any aesthetic, you know, that wasn't, um, you know, some <laughs> sometimes joke that like, you know, I think some Christians have the opinion that, you know, if if God would have created the world properly, you know, he would have wrote Jesus's name into the Grand Canyon, <laughs> you know, like that's uh, so really on the nose, no room for mystery or wonder, no room actually for frame disruption. That's really mm-hmm. the thing for me. So I, I, you're right. There's a lot of people and, and maybe in the last eight years or so of my life, I've inhabited more um, Christian contexts where uh there's sus- there's probably more sus- de- certainly more suspicion mm-hmm. to um anything that might resemble getting outside of a rational engagement with the scriptures so i think you're spot on and there are certainly people that have a uh, yeah. very little experience yeah. with the stuff and yet there's that deep hunger for right. it right well i think you know Anytime we're faced with the unknown, we're either attracted to it or we're repelled from it or some combination of the two. And and so that's where the rub is, is that these experiences and these things that we're talking about, they deal with the unknown. They deal with, with a bit of uncertainty. Uh, and that's okay, you know. Um, but I think that, you know, a couple of, examples come to mind for me that that might not be so left field um Zinzendorf who was the father of the Moravians he had this encounter where he went into an art museum and he saw this painting it was a depiction of the face of Christ and he looks at this painting and he gets transfixed by this image that was painted of Jesus and he can't move. I don't I don't know how long he stood there, but he stood there for links and links of times just transfixed before this painting and having this encounter through the painting. From that experience, he went off and started the Moravian missionary movement and a prayer movement that lasted over a hundred years of like round the clock prayer that came from an encounter with a painting. Something similar happened with Henry Nouwen, and we just went through this book in the Makers and Mystics Creative Collective, but The Return of the Prodigal Son. Same thing happened for Nouwen. He got transfixed before Rembrandt's painting of The Return of the Prodigal Son, and he sat there for like five hours, ended up coming back, and over and over, he's just having this experience of understanding something about the nature of God and also understanding something about the nature of himself that happened through an encounter with visual art. Um, a scriptural example that, that goes back to music, which I love because it deals with some crazy instruments and things like that, but it was when the band of prophets are coming down the mountain in Samuel. Yeah, it was Saul. You know, and it says that 
when Saul encountered these musicians, he was turned into another man. I mean, it, it, it changed him. Like, what does that even mean? Like, what happened to him? It, it physiologically, it, it did something to him. Yes. You know, and, uh, and so I, I think that, yes, there's a ditch on both sides of the road. And so people that, that are listening, um, you know, don't think that I'm, I'm just uh, uh, a, a new ager in different clothing here. No, I'm in covenant with Jesus and, and, and I, I love Jesus and, uh, and, uh, and that's where, that's my home base. But I think that there is a ditch on either side of the road. But if we cut off this dimension of experience out of fear or wrong associations, we're, we're going to cut off an entire dimension of a robust faith that I believe we're all invited to participate in, you know. And a biblical one too, right? Exactly. I mean, that's the thing, you know, for those that listen to this program and they're like me, you know, I, I, I see myself as, you know, as a follower of Jesus, I'm committed to the Christian story and that we find the, that, that Christian story affirmed by Jesus and the apostles in the narrative of scripture. So, uh, you know, obviously the people that listen that go like, I, all right, so I want to kind of maybe start from there. Like if you're saying, I, I, People might feel uncomfortable with the idea that um, maybe that that singing music um, would be anything more than just like an obedient response right. to God. Like we just do it, and uh, it, it's it's good for us in the sense that we're doing what we're told to do. You know, <laughs> right. for those that maybe are like, well, is the idea that we actually need to have our normative frame of consciousness disrupted in order to see God more clearly. And of course, again, like you're saying, Stephen, to have that happen does not mean someone is instantly going to see God more clearly. You know, I, I think there's a right. wide range of things people can experience, just like you have some dreams you know, not every dream that you have is going to be a Joseph kind of dream, you know, a Daniel interpreting Nebuchadnezzar sort of dream. Sometimes you just shouldn't have ate pizza right before bed, you know? <laughs> right. But yet, like, we see these things in, in the scriptures. We uh -huh. see evidence of this Saul and the band of prophets. I right. always loved that one. Yes, it's that so wild. Really cool. And he's like, I, I, if I remember correctly, he's like caught up in through the night with mm -hmm. them. You oh, know, yeah. so it wasn't like he just heard these guys come down and they were singing a hymn. He's uh -huh. like, "Man, that's my jam." You know, right. I feel so much better. <laughs> like he was caught up in something we might say is a trance, yeah, in the flow state. Right. There's something that altered his state of consciousness so much so that we'll use the the New Testament Greek word metanoia happened for Saul. Mm -hmm. Right, a changing mm -hmm. of the mind, and at the core, metanoia is the central command mm -hmm. of Jesus in the Gospels. Yes. You know, Mark summarizes it as he went around, you know, preaching, repent, metanoia right. for the kingdom of God is at hand. That's right. And so we're talking about something that has to change, mm -hmm. and there's some good to this, change our framework from being self-centered, you know, mm -hmm. from those evolutionary appetites for some of you that are maybe less less comfortable with, uh, you know, the Christian language. There's no mm -hmm. denial that if we acted on all of our evolutionary impulses, we would be moral monsters, right? right. Um, so there's something that happens. So, Stephen, you've been saying, like, you've been going through this stuff in the scriptures, mm -hmm. exploring the instances in which the scriptures talk about things that seem like altered states of consciousness, mm -hmm. a breaking of our normative frame are happening. Do you have some handy, you know, you've mentioned some already. Do you have some handy you want to maybe explore a little bit more with, together? Sure. Well, I, I want to preface it by saying this, and I, I want to preface it by saying the reason I think this conversation is important right now is far greater than personal interest. Mm 
Uh, I'm very much interested in this, and this is just the life story that I've lived to date. But it's interesting because we live in a time where, by and large, the Christian understanding of the cosmos is, is not universally accepted in America. Let's just stay here in our home uh, but beyond that, it's like we've we've gone beyond secularism. We've kind of left secularism behind, and now it's like this whole wild west in our culture. And it's what's post secular, right? And so, what's really interesting is you know take away the Christian narrative in that in that understanding, and at the same time, you see a rise in psychedelics, and you see a rise. Um, in tarot cards, you see a rise in different forms of occultism because Even like explicit pagan worship, right? I mean, there are actually um, there are actually temples right. being built in Iceland to Thor yeah. and, right. and Odin again. It's and, wild, and and exactly, you know. My my point is that. I, I don't know if it was C.S. Lewis that said this, but it's the, the phrase that says, if you deny men food, they'll gobble poison. And it, you, you can't take away the human yearning for transcendence. You can't take away the human yearning to respond to something greater than ourselves, right? And if we're not finding that, if we have reduced our Christian faith to a set of rationalistic rules and regulations that are going to appeal to a certain, you know what I'm saying? Totally. People are going to look for it elsewhere, right? But the, but the desire and the need for wonder, I mean, that's one of the arguments that I, that I make all throughout my podcast and my writings and things is that creativity is not ornamental. It's essential to, to the human experience. Wonder is, and reverence, these are things that, whether you accept the Christian narrative or not, these are things that we all commonly share a need for, right? So that's why I think this discussion is important. Yes. And, yes. and there are many examples in Scripture that I think ties in, uh, whether it would be an altered state of consciousness, if you call it, or a trance state, or, a, you know, um, and what's the purpose of it? It's interesting. It, it, nine times out of ten, the examples always lead to creativity, cultural transformation, something being built, the kingdom of heaven coming to earth, right? So if you, if you, if you go back to Jesus' prayer that he taught the disciples, you know, your kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven. Well, it's my persuasion that the creative process is how that happens. And part of the, in, in, in the creative process for me is inherently a spiritual process. So you, yes. you know, Healthy spirituality will always be creative, and creativity will always lead to spirituality. It will always be rooted in spirituality, and I think that's why those two things are are, are connected for me. They're they're inseparable, you know. Yes. One and and some of my Old Testament scholar friends uh, might tear me to shreds on this one. You, you might maybe we'll get some hate mail, but I love it nonetheless. And I think it stands that when Adam was in the garden with, with God in, in the narrative there, it says that Adam fell into a deep sleep is the way we translate that. Um, but the Hebrew of that word is Adam fell into a trance. Adam fell into an altered state of consciousness with God. God actually put Adam into this altered state of consciousness, right? And then reaches into his being and I'm God because I can't wait. I can't wait for the comments on this one. This is gonna be oh, great, no. Stephen. Keep going. Sorry. God reaches into Adam's being and and forms Eve. And then when Adam comes to, when Adam comes back to normal everyday frame of mind and he witnesses the creativity of God. That's where we get the first utterance of poetry in the Bible from a human being. Bone of my bone, flesh of my flesh. You know, Adam, Adam's response to God's creative work is poetry. 
And, and so it's like God's creative work inspires humanity's creative work. And it came from this spiritual encounter between God and man. And, and there are so many others. I mean, we mentioned, you know, Samuel and the prophets. I love to talk about Peter in Acts chapter 10 when Peter's on the rooftop. And it says that he fell into a trance. And in that state, um, he began to see the animals that, that came down in the sheet. And this, this whole wild experience that Peter is having with God. And, and, and maybe I'll get us both in trouble for saying this too, but what's really interesting about that experience is that it completely ran contrary to Peter's theology. The vision that God showed Peter denied everything he knew about Jewish law and tradition. It was, it was completely countercultural to him. What God showed him blew his theology out of the water. And Peter... Peter's response is he didn't deny that it was God. He just said, no, I'm not doing that. <laughs> <laughs> We've all been there. Right, you know? <laughs> and, um, but my point is, again, and, and perhaps part of the difference is these experiences are born out of intimate communion with God, right? So just to say it clearly for my own sake— I'm not endorsing psychedelics and drug experiences, and I'm not endorsing alternative forms of religious experience and, and then slapping a Christian name on that. I mean, I, I've been there, I've done those things, and, and I've come to a completely different understanding with all of that. But what I am saying is that for the follower of Jesus, there is a place of intimate communion whether that comes through liturgy and ritual, whether that comes through crazy charismatic musical expressions, whether that comes through visual art in a gallery somewhere, there are experiences um, that, that are holy, that are healthy, that are good, that are orthodox, and they are intended by God. You mentioned earlier that the flow state is maybe a little bit different than, than some of the spiritual experiences. I, I agree with that, but I also believe that there's definitely an intersection. Um, oh, yes. You know, where these things overlap. And I think when we talk about the kingdom of heaven coming to earth and, and that whole thing, for me, the flow state is, is part of where that happens. Um, you know, one of my my mentors said to me one time, prayer is not God's strategy. But if you don't pray, you'll never find God's strategy. You know, and 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 so there's a there's a place of intimacy with God in prayer, in worship, in communion that I believe can help us um, to position our lives in such a way that when God's creative ideas come to us, we're ready to receive them. You know. Um, and that, that might get into some other stuff, and I know I'm long-winded here. No, it's not. It's great. That's excellent. Yeah. So maybe we should even distinguish between like some of the terminology here that we're using. You know, Even when we talk about um, having something that alters your state of consciousness, there's kind of like a spectrum here, right? Mm -hmm. And even in that, that book we've been going through, um, oh, yeah. you know, there, there's, there's, there's scholarly debate about like, well, what actually constitutes an altered state of consciousness? Because we're like constantly throughout our day we're experiencing things that are, are are changing the the way the neural networks are communicating when we eat when we're hungry you know if you've been fasting for a long period of time you're thinking differently um the flow state for example um you know the the, the flow state you know there's debate on is this like an altered state of consciousness or is it right on the threshold are there levels to this you know, so the flow state for those that aren't listening, and maybe you can describe it better than I can, Stephen, is, um, you know, just think about when you watch, uh, like, Steph Curry lose his mind in a basketball game. Right. Steph Curry always shoots, has historically shot the ball very, very well, but there are moments where you watch him play basketball, mm -hmm. and it's like the hoop becomes an, the ocean, and right. he can throw it in from anywhere on the court. And I've had those experiences as a basketball player. You've had them as a musician mm -hmm. as well. Um, anybody that's been a musician knows the difference between when, you know, you're, you're playing and you're still, you're playing well. And that 
thing that happens where like everybody on the stage, whether you're playing by yourself or you're with others, you get into the pocket together, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. you get into the flow, you, you get in the flow <laughs> together. And there's something that happens where again, you push up beyond what may be simple and easy for you. And there seems to be the flow channel is in between where your skills and competency would find what you're doing to be too simple and a point in which it becomes far too advanced. And the flow state seems to be that channel in between there that kind of pushes up against your limitations and maybe mm. expands them. And so there's no, those of you that have experienced anything like that in sports, in music, um, even in, you know, my friend John Verveke talks about he's experienced it doing martial arts mm -hmm. uh, as well, where you're like, I'm not even thinking about my movements anymore. Um, so you certainly have that. And again, like you're saying, Stephen, I think that is, um, I would say it's neutral. Mm -hmm. uh, the flow state is neither like inherently good or bad from my perspective. It is a tool that can be used ideally for the good, mm -hmm. right? Um, you can certainly get into the flow state doing things that we would say are are not for our good as well. Right, um, for sure. Absolutely. Altered states of consciousness, as people think about that, again, you don't necessarily have to go to someone like being in a, in a vision, right. right? Like a waking dream. Totally. Um, you know, anybody that's consumed alcohol or anything before, mm -hmm. you know, there's degrees in which you can have a couple of drinks and you kind of got a little buzz mm -hmm. and still that buzz has shifted your normative frame and there's a difference between that and mm -hmm. like you know doing a heroic dose <laughs> you know of psychedelics right. and now you're just you're you're somewhere else entirely so mm -hmm. um i've even proposed Stephen, like i think in some ways jesus's parables mm. were intended to be narratives that altered people's normative frames and frustrated them in yes. a sense that allowed you to go, we talk about, I talk about it again, using Verveke's uh, work, like, you know, it's trying to figure out the nine dot problem of life. Mm -hmm. If you've ever done the, seen the nine dot problem, you got three columns of three dots and you know, you're supposed to be able to try to find a way to connect all of them together while just going on a continuous line, having that line be straight. And mm -hmm. the problem is, if you stay within the box, so it were, you can't connect all nine, but you mm -hmm. actually have to go outside of the frame to extend one of the lines in order mm -hmm. to make the angle work. And so, you know, when we talk about the nine dot problems of life, we have this framework that we inhabit when we're trying to figure out, you know, what's my purpose in life? Right. What am I made for? Um, things on the grand meaning making scale like that all the way down to like, man, I got this issue with my wife and my kids mm -hmm. and we brush up against these problems mm -hmm. in the language of the Christian scriptures. We could, we can even talk about how we have reoccurring sins. Mm -hmm. You know, there's just patterns in our life where we keep acting in a way that's not in keeping with God's optimal ordering for creation. Yes. So it's dysfunctional and it produces hurt. And it's like, we're stuck and we can't figure out the nine dot problem. And then you're sitting in, you know, the first century in Palestine and you hear this, this Jewish rabbi tell a story <laughs> about a good Samaritan. Mm -hmm. And you're Jewish and you're like, Samaritan? Good? You don't associate those two. That story right. if you, disrupts your frame and narrative yes. as an art invites people into that story and it's yes. disrupted the framework for all of a sudden you're like, oh my goodness, I guess there could be a good Samaritan. I guess what actually makes you righteous isn't, you know, the culture that you were born into. And so uh -huh. Jesus has totally disrupted the frame of his listeners. And it's, you know, they weren't passing around a blunt or anything like that. Right, right. You know? <laughs> yes. Man, I, you know, I think uh, what you're saying really goes back, you know, earlier I, I said that, you know, destruction is not always the opposite of creativity that that some destruction can actually be part of the creative process and maybe yes. maybe demolition is a better word than destruction you know if you're going to redo your house you might have to tear out a wall and that's actually to the end of a creative purpose 
Jesus's parables very much did the same thing. Like what you're saying, there's a there's a disruptive nature to creativity um, that that is to wake us up out of a stupor. Now yes. that brings up a good point. You know, saying that the, talking about trance and talking about altered states of consciousness. I'm not necessarily talking about a stupor. I'm not talking about a lull. Uh, the 13th century mystics, they would have called it acedia, you know, that, that, um, that state of apathy, you know, and I'm, I'm not talking about that. And, and, and we've used extreme examples, um, you know, Saul and, and psychedelics and all these things. But let me bring it back to the center of the road and I just did an artist profile on Makers and Mystics about Simone Weil. And um, Simone Weil, she is an incredible woman. She only lived to be 34 years old. She was a French Jewish mystic, one of the greatest uh, religious philosophers of the 20th century, she's called now. But she had these radical ideas about attention. And she said, attention taken to its highest degree is the same thing as prayer. It presupposes yes. faith and love. Absolutely unmixed attention is prayer. Okay? And so when you were mentioning Steph Curry and some of these athletes or musicians when they're in the pocket and they're just flowing, it's a state of attention that goes past the will. It's, it's not, you're not willing yourself into this space, but it's an attentiveness where everything else disappears and, and your whole being is now engaged in this experience, right? Yes. And for me, that's where the flow state and some of these contemplative experiences or these spiritual experiences, that's where that intersection is for me, you know? Mm. And that's why I, That's I talk, you know, I talk about um, in my book, Naming the Animals, I talk about contemplation as a creative practice and how we can actually discipline ourselves in contemplation. And it also positions us to receive inspiration along the way. And so I think that's where the flow state and prayer um, and those things overlap and where it doesn't have to be this extreme example of, of, you know, a psychedelic experience or something like that, but it's just posturing your heart to be able to receive, um, you know, uh, I think that's, that's the way beautiful. I it. I, you know, it makes me think of what I have kind of long held to the belief that worship is rightly ordered attention. Yes. You know, it's giving yes. attention to the things that we should that are the proper use mm -hmm. of our attention which is a, a limited resource yeah in a way right, right. that's very difficult for us in our age where we are um in an endless buffet of attention mm -hmm. grabbing opportunities to give right. our attention to the right thing at the right time is in a sense, I mean, this kind of gets to Bonhoeffer now that I think about it, you know, Bonhoeffer mm -hmm. wrestling with what was the will of God, you know, and for Bonhoeffer, he came to the point where he, the conclusion he came to is that the will of God was present tense. Mm -hmm. We had certainly had past um, experiences, you know, so as a Christian, I, I look to scripture, I look to the teaching of Jesus, right? But I'm not actually in that context, in that time, I'm like here and now in a moment mm -hmm. with you mm -hmm. <laughs> and on a screen <laughs> talking through, you know, a bunch of zeros and ones somehow. Yeah. And, um, you know, what I have to figure out is discern with the spirit, what is the thing I should give my attention to? And we certainly have the inherited wisdom of the past that we receive. But for Bonhoeffer, again, this is maybe almost like Aristotelian virtue ethics, what we're trying to do is like apply wisdom, the right wisdom to the specific moment that we inhabit and to give our attention to what is deserving of attention. Yes. Right? Yes. And that doesn't mean, again, as artists, um, as creative people, everybody is inherently creative. You know, Stephen, this is, right. this is your work, right? You know, it's not just for the visual artists and... Yes. Though we want to call that out of people that, that might have dormant gifts. Um, 
but it's it's for people that work with their hands and maybe they're in construction and uh mm-hmm. or they they deal in the world of numbers and balancing books that it doesn't necessarily again look like you you build a home if you're a a contractor you build a home and the the, the home has to have a steeple and a cross right. on the top of it yeah it's like what could I do that could maximize the flourishing of the people that are going to inhabit this house? And in that way, it's cruciform, right? Mm -hmm. Like, how can I give of myself for the benefit and the flourishing of others? Mm -hmm. It's the first scripture verse we memorize, like Jesus's mission, right? It's God so loved the world that he gave. And I think that's where I see the points of intersection with, you know, the the evolutionary science with the Christian scriptures and what we're talking about here is there does seem to be something in which we are born into the world. Yes, we participate in a general awareness of God. And at times that awareness is diminished at times it's heightened, but most of our conscious energy seems to be given to self-preservation. Right. And that self-preservation is not the proper use of our attention. (laughs) Yeah. And I think that gets at, why we need our frame disrupted in different ways, why I needed to, you know, 15 years ago, I needed to go into a room, put some headphones on, listen to songs of water, open myself up to the spirit of God and say, Mm -hmm. transform me, change me, move me outside of myself for the benefit of others and the sake of the world. That was a proper ordering of my attention. I'm so glad you, you brought that quote up. Mm -hmm. Um, Well, I hmm. think it goes back to what you were saying as well with the metanoia and with repentance, you know, to repent is, is to see a new way. It's to, it's it's a new way of seeing. And I think that's where the calling of the church and um, the invitation of the artist overlaps is that there's, there's a calling to help others see to help yes. others see in a new way. And I think, and I know this is true in my own life, you know, um, when acedia, depression, boredom, anxiety, when all of these things, self-preservation, when, when all those things begin to function inside of you, your perception is going to alter. It's going to, it changes the way that you see. Suddenly everything is dark. What did he, what did Jesus say? But, you know, whoa, when the light in you is dark, you know? And I think that, that that's, um, that's why that this is important um, for us as artists and for, for followers of Jesus, and especially for people that are leading in churches is to help others see a new way. Because I know in my own life, um it, over this past year I had to set everything aside and I had to go back to a place of repentance to a place of metanoia to a place of lord help me see correctly help me see rightly because my attention got way skewed and and I think um you know attention really is a form of prayer. And, 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 and it's also Simone Weil again, she said, attention is one of the, um, the greatest forms of generosity, you know? And, and so by virtue of giving our attention to God, by virtue of giving our attention to prayer, um, we, we really can alter, you know, back to, to William Blake, if the doors of our perception were cleansed, we would see eternity, we we would see from that heavenly perspective. And so I think for me as an artist and a musician, part of my heart would be to help others to see according to that that heavenly perspective, you know? Mm. Attention as a form of generosity. Yes. That's beautiful. I, I You know, I just, that's giving language is something that dawned upon me even a couple of days ago. I was sitting in a, just a like a, a group of people in prayer, and somebody brought up in that group my family as they were praying, and I felt a generosity in them even giving their attention. It wasn't like there was a mandatory list of things we were going through and we all have to pray mm-hmm. for this. Um, he brought me and my family up in prayer, and I felt like he was giving his attention to God and saying, not only is my 
attention am I bringing it to you? But I care enough about Paul and his family mm-hmm. to give them my attention. And God, I I want your attention to be towards them. And I I I I, I realized how profoundly loving that act is. And when you're in a room with people, or maybe you've ever been put in the hot seat before, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. Yes. <laughs> I used to do that with students years ago um, on their last day of school, uh, the high school seniors. And we'd go through last day of school, their senior year of high school, we'd put them in the chair and we'd gather their friends around. We'd go through everybody in the class and we would, uh, this was a Christian school, obviously. And we put them in the hot seat and people could pray over them. Mm. And all of them would say that was like, one of the best days of high school. Yeah. For yeah. them. Yes. And there was a there's a way in which you really felt like a, a generosity, a spirit of generosity in what we give, mm-hmm. we're giving our attention to. And um yeah. yeah, and and maybe I'll I'll bring this into the conversation is um that reminds me of the feeding of the 5000. Because, you know, when we're talking about altered states of consciousness, it's not for the sake of a dopamine hit. Sure, it may feel amazing. It may be an incredible experience, but it's unto transformation. It's unto right. something larger. And, mm. you know, it, thinking about an altered state of consciousness and thinking about generosity together, they were out in the middle of the desert and what the disciples saw was their lack. They saw what they did not have. They saw that there were 5,000 plus, you know, that were hungry and no way to get food. But Jesus flipped that again, disrupted the narrative, flipped it on its head, and gave thanks for the nothing that they had. And when, and when Jesus uh, gave thanks in that space, um, through the spirit of generosity, through the spirit of, of wanting to give. And I think that's, that's the transformation for many of us artists and, and just all of us together is getting out of that state of self-preservation, getting out of that state of, of self-focus um, and, and learning the art of generosity. Uh, what happened? But the nothing they had suddenly became an abundance. It became more than enough. And so I think that part of thinking differently, part of metanoia, part of these encounters with God or with the, you know, it's unto the end, again, of the kingdom of heaven coming to earth. It's unto the end of bringing transformation. And I've always loved that story because it echoes, you know, the traditional Christian thought is that God created from nothing. He did, it, it began with nothing, and then through, through the Word, you know, he, he created all things. So Jesus basically did the same thing uh, by taking one boy's fish and loaf of bread and, and then feeding the masses with it. So my hope in my own life is that I can do that, is that I can take the, the nothing that I have, give thanks for it, and through a spirit of generosity and turning away from self-preservation— um, maybe we can offer uh, something to one another so that we don't have to gobble poison, you know? That's it. That's it. That, um, let me just a couple other things and we'll wrap, maybe getting close to needing to wrap up our time together, Stephen. But I, you said something at the beginning of sharing that was beautiful about how, uh, maybe this isn't your exact words, but the purpose of, Let's let's take our charismatic language for example. The purpose of encounter, yeah, is to better equip us for the normative frame that we live yes. in, and it changes it so that our normative frame becomes expanded. And I think I'm thinking about one of the things that Ashley mentioned in our discussion, and the thing that for her she ended up leaving and going. I'm, I'm never going back to psychedelics, is because she felt a decrease a decreasing sense of connectedness to reality when she was not high, when she yeah. was not hallucinating. And, and um, when she encountered Jesus in the, in the context of the Christian story and Christian community, she was feeling more equipped to actually deal with reality. Mm-hmm. It, like, and not to say those other experiences aren't real, but again, the normative frame, their baseline reality 
and I also that got me thinking because another friend had texted me about um, who had listened to that conversation and had have spent a lot of time also in as a as a worship leader in a char- in charismatic context and I, th- I think in our conversation one of the things we came to was realizing you know in a lot of ways there are certain practices that we might say are Christian practices but people employ them in that Gnostic way to escape from reality. And mm. I think we both are familiar with that. There's, there's, there was like a conference culture that yes. I became increasingly disillusioned with where I noticed the same people going from spot to spot. And it was almost as if these were like, these were va- like getaways. It was like going mm. to Disney World yes. every week. And I, I saw in some of them a de- decreasing sense in which they were able to actually deal with reality when they weren't in the flow state in worship. And I think that was the thing I found to be like, okay, this is good what's happening here, but if it's not equipping us to deal with reality, we might be using it in the same way that the person who is, whether through New Age or through psychedelics, Mm -hmm. still trying to do the Gnostic thing. And right. I think maybe that gets at the fundamental difference yes. about escape, about transcendence as a way out, as opposed to, we'll bring in the word that John Mark will be so excited about, as opposed <laughs> to encountering transcendence as a mode of re-enchanting yes. the frame. Absolutely. Man, I'm so glad you brought that up, and I'm so glad we get to to end our time with that, because I think that escapism is the counterfeit of what I'm really hoping to get at. And I'm, and, and I think that you're exactly right. And I think for the Jesus follower that it is more about communion and it is more about, uh, for the mystic would say union with God, you know, that, that the, the life of the mystic aspires toward union with God in all things. And then for my artist friends, and actually you mentioned John Mark, he and I have talked about this a lot. I've had to learn over the years, and I haven't done this well, and I'm still having to learn this, but how to land the plane appropriately. And what I mean by that is, let's say you're a touring musician, you got on the road for six weeks, you've got a room full of people screaming praise at all that you're doing. And then at the end of that time period, all of the crowds are gone. The ecstasy has diminished. You go home, there's dishes in the sink, there's laundry to be done, and you're faced with the everyday. What are you going to do? It's like, you know, can you see what I'm saying? And it's like, mm-hmm. I think that finding peace in the normative frame, as you said, finding wonder in the mundane is another way of saying it. Um, learning that, that, the, that the same ecstatic experience that happens on the mountaintop. I mean, it is so funny, even Jesus himself, he went up to the transfiguration on top of the mountain, and as soon as he came down, he was faced with a demon-possessed maniac. You know, and it's, and it's like there's the highs and lows. But there was a consistency within his person that sustained him through, through all of that. So the very thing that was up here on the mountaintop was still abiding with him here. And I think you're exactly right. We can get into this Disneyland mentality. Um, and I think that's probably one of the biggest dangers. And I think that, um, you know, again, cultivating practices such as daily contemplation, cultivating finding wonder in the mundane, it prepares the heart to be consistent in the ecstasy and in the desert, you know? Mm -hmm. Embracing the dark night of the soul. Yes. (laughs) God help me. I feel like that's... (laughs) I've had to learn that a lot lately. (laughs) Yeah, me too, Stephen. Stephen, this is a blast, man. I could talk for a few more hours, but uh, let's let's do it again. I feel like... um, this is one of those, oftentimes you have these exchanges, you know, from doing podcasts for years, and there was a really good exchange of ideas that's informative for those that are listening. And then you also have conversations where you feel like, oh, I got somewhere mm-hmm. personally that I wasn't at the start. Uh-huh. And that iron sharpening iron, the the the, the Dialogos steal another Verveke 
turn yes. there happened. And so thanks, yes. man. This was a blast. Oh, Let's do it's it again. Been incredible. Yeah, thanks so much, man. It does my heart good to to talk about this with folks that are interested in it, you know. And uh, so this has definitely been invigorating for me as well. That's great. Today's video and podcast wouldn't be possible without the generous support of listeners and viewers just like you over on Patreon. I want to give an extra special thanks to Clint, Jesse, Alex, BJ, Daniel, David, Eli, Elise, Jesse, John Mark, John Michael, Josie, Justin, Kirk, Lola, Luke H, Matthew, Michael Hernstein, Mike Thomas, Paul Spencer, Paul Reese, Rob, Sam P, Sarah R, and Taylor S. Thank you all for your generous support.